Hello. Good afternoon. It is afternoon officially. Now, how many of you saw Scott's talk before? Excellent. We have a little surprise. Scott's going to do another talk. Scott I'm doesn't not, know I'm he's not. doing another talk. Right. Want me to fire up something? Fire it up. Fire so it up. We, we found something with the Norwegian website in my talk. And I said that right after my talk, their cert would expire and their site would go down. And their cert expired and their site is now down. So if anyone knows someone, thank you. <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> Time passed by. <laughs> but yeah, so this is what happens. Let's encrypt cert. Open up the cert. It was like 1 o'clock, right? 1330? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 1300? So if anyone knows anybody at this company and they would like a consultant to help them with... Oh, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> There's plenty in the audience. So yeah, so this is why you need Nell because they would have got a report for this, and I bet they don't know yet. They don't have a Twitter handle either. So if anyone has Facebook or email for them, be a friend and let them know. And I'm going to hand over to you now. Thanks very much. Just point that out. Thank yeah. you very much. Welcome. So he gets a, usually when someone finishes a talk, they get a round of applause. There you go. Hey, <laughs> I'm leaving. Yay! All right. Welcome to Hacking a Cat, our alternate attack vectors for security people. Um, this talk is born a bit out of frustration um, because I was asked at one point to give the most insane way to attack something, and I'll explain what happened. And it comes around uh, working against uh, digital implants. So, for example, embeddable systems. So I'm going to show you, this is all hypothetical, none of this is actually has happened or legit, but it just will show you some ideas of way you can potentially think of something, and then also how we are going to kind of have to think a little bit further. Now, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Niall. I am the head of cybersecurity at Capgemini. Um, I do a lot of things with uh, things. And I have Twitter, unlike some of the uh, previous people we've been talking about. I do like to be tweeted as, but not as much as Scott and Troy. Um, you can visit my company's website. Don't Please don't visit my blog. It's well out of date. So before we start, we've just had lunch. We've had about three or four talks. And I want to do something which I find is very in good before we kind of get into this deep type of talk. Please, everyone just close your eyes. Take a, no, I'm not going to steal stuff off you, don't worry. Take a deep breath all the way down to your stomach. Hold in, breathe back out through your nose. Sorry, in through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Give your shoulders a shake and wake up. Excellent. It's a little bit refreshing because this talk is extremely dark because I get to talk about something that I am very passionate about. I get to tell you that like security is extremely hard. Security is very hard, and not in the kind of way that just, just because I do it, security is hard. No, security is hard because like the mastery of anything, it takes time. Like carpentry, artistry, cooking, all these things to be good at it takes time. It takes effort, it takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of work to get to that position that you can say, I am an expert in this. I have been doing InfoSec for 20 years. I feel like a noob half the time I walk around because there is something new every time. Someone shows me something new every day. And I go, that is insane, that is crazy. And it comes from the understanding of things like risk and threat. Do you understand the concepts of risk and threats? A risk, something that could potentially happen. A threat, something that could potentially happen to you. Now, I am a software developer. I have been for a while, a long time in my life. And as a software developer, I created many, many crazy programs. And I am married with two kids. And as a father, I created two batshit crazy children. They are the jewels of my life. They provide endless entertainment for me, and also endless stories for my talks, because they are very, very smart. Well, they're smarter than me, which I don't know what that really means, but they're smarter than me at times. My two-year-old, she's a little girl, and she goes, she, what I find she does is she's, she knows how to play her father, just like all little two-year-old girls do. And I go, 
I come up to her and I'm just, you know, the typical father, you're playing a little bit, you're having a bit of fun. And you go over and you go, ha, Papa's got your soother. And my two-year-old, lip out, big eyes up, looking at her father. No, she's up to about here. And she goes, Papa. I said, yes, honey. Come here. What? Hand, straight up, grabs me by the beard. <laughs> and then lets go of her feet. Which means gravity kicks in about now. And I go, Hoo-yah! She goes, I have the soother. And I went, we're cool. We're cool. We're cool. Risk factor I didn't know with a beard. Number one, threat factor, my daughter. So I'm sitting on the couch. Barna is on the TV. You know, that uh, thing we also call babysitting, Judy. And I hear... <laughs> it's like, what the hell is that? And I poke my head over and I see my two-year-old. And she's pushing a trip-trap stool over to the counter. And she hops up on the counter and puts her hand up to grab the door to the um, cupboard and looks in and she just goes... Arr! Slams the door back down into the bathroom, gets a small stool, brings it back in on the counter, back up, grabs the cookies. Takes a cookie, puts the thing back in, happy with herself, goes, eh, starts getting down. I'm still on the couch. At this point, my wife walks in and she goes, What are you doing? And I went, Which one of us? <laughs> because at this point, I am an accomplice, not a parent. And she's like, she's going, Niall, why on earth did you let her do that? I wanted to see how far she'd get. <laughs> and she goes, what, 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 what? And I said, just come on, let me, it's a, she wasn't going to hurt herself. She just wanted a cookie. We're good. Niall, don't let the child do that. And I said, well, okay. And I, and I thought about this because this is my risk picture. My risk picture was if I, to save the cookies, I put them up high three times the height of my child. Apparently, that is not high enough. I have found this out. Now, it is an understanding that I didn't fully understand the threat picture. Because that is the difficulty with security. Security is thinking about all the different things that could potentially go wrong, and then wondering, what did I miss? The attacker has only got to find that one mistake. That's all it takes. Think about that when you write code. Think about that as an arch in your architecture. Think about that when you develop something. Have you thought of all the potential risks? And most of us will be going, I think so. But experience helps us define this. Now, the, talk, the reason this talk was developed was back in about 2014, I, before that, I had submitted a couple of talks to Oradev. It's a conference in Sweden. And they had said, no. Now, as a speaker, that is a traditional thing that happens is sometimes you get rejected, quite all of you in the front. And it happens. You just, your, your talk doesn't hit the mark. You get some sort of kind of, you might get some feedback. And I asked for some feedback and they said, sorry, we got so many submissions, we don't have time to reply to everyone individually. Kind of like what happens when Santa doesn't give you a good present. So I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll try again next year. And I was down in Poland doing a talk. And prepping for my talk, I fired up a Wi-Fi pineapple. Have you seen this device? All familiar with it? The rogue access point. And a computer connected to it, as it does, and began to access the Oradev backend database through the web application, which was running over an insecure um, a web connection. And the person logged in, so I captured the username and password. As it happens, it just, you know, this traffic is going along, you're kind of going, woo, credentials, yay. So if you've ever used like um, uh, SSL strip or something, it creates a creds uh, file for you to look at. So after my talk, I kind of look at the stuff and I just, before I delete it, I just have a quick goose in case there's something odd and you know, you get some kind of more interesting stories for a talk. And I notice, Oradev, and I notice a username, and I notice a password. And I was like, this is odd. And I come out of my talk and I ask someone, I says, do you know by anyone the name of Emily who works in Oradev? 
and the organizer says, yes, she's the uh, main organizer of Lordev, and she's in the speaker room. And I went, right. So I rock up to the speaker room, and I see this French lady beating the living daylights out of a Mac. And she's like panicked, because the internet has dropped, because she was connected via me, and I've turned it off. Um, <laughs> as you do. And I go up to her, and I said, hi, are you Emily? And she goes, oui. And I says, hi, I'm Niall. Um, I believe this is yours. And she goes, oh. And um, she didn't really say that. She said something much more intense in French, but that was the best gift I could come up with. And I was like, and she goes, how did you do that? I said, it's in the talk. You've rejected three times. <laughs> and I said, why was my re rejected three times? You've given it too many times. I said, oh. And we had a good laugh, and I explained about it. And I said, you know, for her, her risk picture didn't, didn't include an Irishman in Poland trying to hack her Wi-Fi accidentally. And I said, okay. So fast forward to last year, and I'm on, in an airport lounge in Paris, or on my way to Paris. And I'm sitting there, and the phone rings, and it's Emily, and she says, Niall, could you do a keynote for Oradev um, about hacking humans? And I said, you mean social engineering? She goes, no. I mean about hacking the things in humans. And now, you can imagine, I'm sitting there in a lounge, something like this, glass of champagne, phone, looking very businesslike. And I go, so, in a loud voice, you want me to hack someone's pacemaker? <laughs> and all of a sudden, there was a load of people who went, <laughs> Security. <laughs> and she goes, yes. Is it possible that you, for you to hack somebody's pacemaker? And I'm sitting there, and the champagne's getting better as I drink it. And I'm thinking, it is. But I have to have a few conditions. And she says, go on. I said, well, the problem with pacemakers and devices like this is they have a few things. They have this thing like, for example, you'd have to know that the person has a heart implant. So we assume we know this. Then figure out what brand of heart implant it is. It's going to be kind of tricky. It's radio frequency. Then get the proprietary reprogrammer for that device within range of the victim. Then tinker around nearby without the person becoming suspicious. Or dead. That's not there. I'm only reading what's there. So the ba last bit is the key point here. How would you do this without the person becoming suspicious? So I don't look suspicious. I look Irish, but I'm not suspicious. But you can imagine me rocking up beside you and going, Hi. How's it going? Hold this. Closer. <laughs> Closer. Like you love it. Hold it there quietly for three minutes. <laughs> Up a bit, down a bit, breathe in. That is not going to look suspicious. So I thought, OK, there has to be a better way of doing this. Now, hackers think in graphs. We think of alternative ways to get to our target. It is not always through the front door. There are alternatives for us to work with. We may, for example, go and look for information about you. We could spearfish you. We could do alternative things. So I said, OK, if we're going to do this, we need a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking and in-the-cat thinking. I assumed that the person would have, if they've got a Wi-Fi or NFC-enabled heart, because these things exist, instead of you having to like, be torn open and check for like, if you've got a heart arrhythmia, they just put something over your chest and they go, ah, you need a tune-up, you're done. Very handy. I thought, OK, so maybe they've got other IoT devices in the house, because you know things like this are popular. And let's assume that they have a cat. OK, we'll assume they have a cat, because people like cats. Cats never try to kill you, uh, so I have been told. And you're sitting there, and I think they've got, maybe got the IoT device, and they've got this little, do you know the little collar for the cat so it can get in and out of doors? It just like the door opens because it recognizes the NFC and goes in and out. And what if I noticed this cat and I just injected it or put a small receiver in it, like just hacked the cat, bump, and the cat would jump up in your lap, cuddle into you, you're like, good cat, happy cat. You know, cat's there going, feed me. 
I want to kill you, feed me. And you're thinking, this is fine. And the cat's reading all the data. Good. Cat goes back outside to pee, it passes a rock, it offloads the data to me, I get to analyze it. Cat passes back, I reprogram the device on the cat. Cat jumps up on your lap, gives you a heart attack. You think it's love. Hi, my heart skipped a beat when my cat jumped on my lap. I'm sitting there. So I have literally turned your cat into a weapon. Now, this is an alternate attack vector. This is like pure insanity at work because there's no real way for this to work in real life. Is there? No one makes mistakes with their code, right? So I'm, I'm saying, okay, this is me kind of thinking a little bit laterally out of the box and working on the idea that you only understand threats when you have experience of threats. So my son, who is six, he's like all six-year-old boys, insane. He has no fear, and he has ultimate confidence in all his abilities. So he's there on the couch, tea towel around his neck, going, Superman, and jumping around like all kids do. And he goes, Papa. I was like, what? Look at me. I'm about to jump off the couch and land on that cushion over there. And there's a, in the middle of this, there's a table. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks, Ari. Uh-oh. You've been there. And I'm sitting there going, wait a second, son. And he goes, what? And I went, eh. there you go. He goes, he hops off. He lands ass first in the cushion. And he goes, see, I didn't hit the table. And I went, yes, well done. But that's my experience because I look at this and I go, there's a problem. I know there's going to be a risk. I know there's a threat here. So I'm going to help him get past it. But a lot of programmers still don't know about things like XSS. They still don't know about things like SQL I, SQL injection, because they have never had to deal with it. Unlike most Irish people, we are SQL injection experts because our second names, a lot of our second names, have O apostrophe in them. <laughs> All right? This is really fun because I used to teach classic ASP at university. And we would give them a simple thing of, like, for example, let's write a hotel booking system in ASP, in VB script, because I didn't like them. And they would write it, and you'd always spot this, the students that had an O'Connell, O'Donnell, O'Malley in, the, in their thing, because the first thing I'd do is I'd put the apostrophe in to see what would happen. And that's how I taught people about SQL injection, but that is the thing. So when my son was looking at this video, he was there, he was really convinced nothing would go wrong. Poor six-year-old. Everyone else in the audience is probably going, this is gonna hurt. They're gonna be smelling barbecue for a month, you know? And it's because we need to look at our experience and stuff we have learned in the past, because if we don't go back to all the different mistakes that have been learned, we were doomed to repeat them. There are things happening now in new IoT devices that would have, have been never existed or haven't existed in applications for years. So if we want to go back to one of the first ever hacks, like we look at something as, as really bizarre as Marconi. Marconi is the father of the wireless age. Not like Wi-Fi, but wireless, the traditional wireless radio. And Marconi was a genius inventor, but he was also a fantastic marketeer. And he said, uh, he was doing a demo down in, in the Royal, uh, Pal uh, Royal uh, uh, Pavilion in London, and he was saying, my system is unhackable. Now, how many of you have ever said to anyone, my system is unhackable? Really? One guy, and he's on my team. We have to discuss this later. <laughs> not one person is that crazy in the audience. Well done, Hans. There's, we are not, we, why would we not say something's unhackable? Because what do you think will happen next? Free pen test. Free pen test. <laughs> there's, there's a really good thread on Twitter at one point where someone said, I've been working 20 years in IT, and we've never had a data breach, and the, literally the inbound of packets was insane. But Marconi said this. He said, our system is unbreakable, unhackable. 
So a gentleman by the name of John Neville Maskeline stood up and said, please, sir, hold it my beer. Now, John Neville is an inventor too, but he is also credited as a magician. And so what happened was he thought about how this was going to work. He knew that Marconi had his assistant 300 miles away in Dover and was going to send a message near instantaneously to the royal uh, to the events they were having in London. And he thought about it and he says, I w I'm guessing, I'll make a couple of assumptions. One, Marconi hasn't thought that anyone will try to break this. And two, we'll assume that he, everyone else doesn't know anything about this. But Maskeline was also inventing wireless technology and was trying to do it, but, or trying to sell it, but couldn't due to patents. So what he ended up doing was he effectively man in the middle the device because he found out that all the receivers were listening on all channels or all frequencies. So basically he intercepted it, it never made it to Marconi's device and he just sent something else. He, what he did was he sent a thing, rats, 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 rats. So this thing started pumping out this whole uh, thing and Marconi was going, that's not what's supposed to be sent. And then it started coming out with, there was a little fella from Italy. And it continued a little bit more racy than that. But Marconi was proven wrong. Okay? And since then, we've started to secure things. We don't assume that people won't be able to find them out. Because if we look a little bit further back in history, we look at like this. This is, does anyone recognize this screen? It's a virus from 1992, all right? It's a boot sector virus. For those who are old enough in the audience to figure out what that is, it is what happened when you 3D printed a save icon and you put it in your computer and it infected your computer, okay? When you put an old floppy disk in, the thing would go and then it would infect the MBR, the master boot record, because no one ever thought to quarantine the MBR to check if someone would write code there and overwrite a potential disk. So now this is protected by default now. We fast forward to something like 1999. We had I Love You and Melissa. Anyone around when this was launched? Yep. Anyone in corporate when this was launched? Yeah. Randomly going around and plugging out computers. And please don't say I love you, because that was the thing. And, what ha and where did this come from? This was because Microsoft allowed VBS scripting as a kind of productivity tool within Outlook. And it would say you could automatically create uh, um, com objects and then get them to do things and interact with them. This was a great idea. It was a productivity suite tool, or a productivity tool. And then someone kind of went, I wonder could I automate it to send more email and do more spreading? And they did. And since then, the Microsoft, uh, or specifically the object, uh, object model, Microsoft, our Outlook object model, has been locked down. And we look at something a bit, bit closer. And we look at like NotPetya and WannaCry. These came from a very old bug in SMB v1, released under the Shadow Brokers uh, dump on GitHub, that someone said, hi, we've got an eternal blue, we've got this thing that'll allow us to propagate through SMB v1, and we're going to combine it with ransomware to make a ransomware worm. Now we've turned off SMB v1 by default. So the more we find out, the more we react, the more we change how to do stuff. And this is our evolution of security because we begin to understand threats, we begin to recognize threats because we say, this has been done before, if we do this, we're gonna get so pwned, we're gonna end up in Troy's talk. And no one wants to end up in Troy's talk. But this happens, and we, like, so if you want a more kind of more different pragmatic version of security and being reactive, we look at things like airports. Airport security is highly reactive. It reacts to threats in a very specific way. It usually shuts down things. 1974, you could get onto an airplane with a shotgun because no one assumed that a person flying in an airplane would take it over. But then it became a political tool to hijack aircraft. 
So they started bringing in things like, for example, scanning, electromagnetic scanning. Then we go forward to, say, for example, 2005, where someone tried to bring a certain amount of liquid through an airport in Glasgow, and so they said, now you're only allowed to bring 100 milliliter bottles through. Okay? Things change. 2001 was another example. The TSA was implemented to stop and do more advanced screening because of the horrific events that happened there. We react, security reacts. If you were to look at an airport back in 1980, it would not look like anything we have right now. Yet we just go, this is fine. Because we adapt and we work with security and we get better at it. The thing is, though, if you start thinking about being security conscious, what happens? Paranoia. Paranoia. People call you paranoid. As soon as you start saying, oh, we should do this, people go, don't be so crazy, Niall. Don't be so paranoid. It's a common reaction. Why? People don't see the risk. People don't see the risk, and people are inherently good. So I ask a question, why do you lock your door at night? Who doesn't lock their door at night? Where do you live? <laughs> There's always one guy that lives out in the woods. I did this guy, it was a particular guy, he did it. He was in Finland, and I think the nearest thing to him was 80 miles away. And I was like, God, man, he says, I don't need to lock my door. You live out in the woods, so therefore you don't lock your door. What about polar bears? Because <laughs> apparently that's all that lives up here. But why do you lock your door? For those that do lock their doors. It locks automatically? You have an IoT lock? No good. We lock our door because we know people will sometimes walk in. They might do this. Now, when I moved up to Norway first, coming from Dublin, I automatically, when I came into the apartment, I was living in a nice, fairly safe part of Stavanger. Like, and I say fairly safe, it means like, you know, hyper safe in comparison to any other place I've lived in the world. Close the door, and I lock it, and I walk in. And my wife goes, why on earth do you keep locking the door? I said, because it's automatic, I, just in case someone will come in, because we won't see them. And she goes, this, that's crazy, that's crazy, no one do that. And I'm there at ONS. If you've ever heard of ONS, it's the big oil and gas symposium in Stavanger. And what you can do is you can rent out your apartment to visiting delegates for a certain amount of money. It's a very handy way to kind of earn it. And it means that we don't, ha we don't have to build a ton of new hotels that won't be used. So there's this gentleman. I'm walking out with a bag full of um, dirty diapers, as you do, because you're a father. And you're like, the child does a lot of shite. And off you're going. And there's this man. He opens the door and he goes, this isn't the stairs. And I'm standing there going, no, it is not. And I said, are you lost? And he goes, apparently so. I said, the stairs are behind you. You go back that way and up. Let me show you how to get there. And he was very confused. I was confused. But it was a case of that we're sitting there going, OK, now I understand why you locked the door. Because people might randomly walk in. And another thing that happens is, where do people put their house keys and their car keys when they come in? right beside the door. So the door's open, you grab some keys, you walk back out. So that is why we lock the door. Not because we want to stay safe, we just want to keep our car keys in the same bowl so we'll remember them every time. All right? Because we are a product of our society. We are a product of our environment. Norway is extremely safe, which makes Norwegians very naive. You're lovely, you're very naive. But 1,000 years ago, you were not. You were neither lovely nor naive. <laughs> we remember. That's why I'm here. I'm the advanced force. I'm preparing you. I'm a traitor to my own country. OK? The Irish people built towers against you because you kept stealing our gold and our pints and our pubs and calling them their own, but giving them the name Irish pubs. Which is a really weird thing when you land in Norway, the first thing they say is, do you want to go to the Irish pub? And I'm like, no, we have them at home, they're called pubs. <laughs> do you, can we not go to the Norwegian bar? No, they're not fun. They're full of Norwegians. I'm like, okay. Uh, so, we are a product of our environment. Like, when you're working with Swedes, you just, this is the whole thing you have, it's fika everywhere, okay? I had to learn what this meant. I thought it was a dirty word. 
it's a word for just means of like increase the amount of calories you can eat in a day. Because meetings stop mid-conversation. Fika. I'm like, what? What is that? Is it a fire drill? Fika means going for coffee and having cake. But we are a product of our environment. And usually the only way we get changed is by a massive transformation. Something seismic has to happen for us to change. A massive thing happened in the US, it caused a change in the whole transport branch. But that doesn't happen every year. It doesn't happen every, thank God it doesn't happen nearly every century. But there are things that happen to us all um, that cause a massive change in us and give us a different appreciation of risk. And that is becoming a parent. Okay? When you become a dad or a mother, you generally inherit this in super gene gets activated. And it is called a parent's sense. We spot things. So this is what happens when you have like this man going, eh, this is going to hurt tomorrow, and a baseball bat, and the child, um, Pokemon? <laughs> this is known as a dad reaction. Every dad gets this. It's automatically we begin to we spot things. You know, it's that whole catch things when children fall. We... <laughs> Can't, couldn't do it. I, I, I remember being in bars and I couldn't catch pints, but if you ask me now, I can probably catch it with my foot, kick it back up, and it'll hand in my hand, and I'll go drink it. I don't try that with the children. But the dad reaction happens. We gain this super skill. We also gain a, a different view of life. So I, a lot of people, what they do is they child-proof houses. I house-proof children. That's what I've done with my children. I house-proofed them. I made sure that they can go into other people's houses and not kill themselves. Because you know what happens is when you have children, you, you basically take everything that's on the, this level and you move it up high because you know they're going to break it. And then you go to your brother's house who doesn't have kids and you're like, why have you got knives on the floor? Why is there razor blades in your couch? And he goes, well, I, you know, I'd sit around them. And I... And I'm, and I, I he says, it's fine, but this is where we begin to understand. Now, it doesn't always work in our favor, okay? So watch the kid in the back. Dip, 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 Ball. Child. So ladies and gentlemen, that's how you put child abuse in a talk and everyone laughs. Now, we are on the cusp of a digital revolution again. We have had kind of wearables. We have had insertables, which I learned about in a talk. We are now are going to have embeddables. Embeddable software, embeddable hardware within you to increase you, make you better. Like this is a printed circuit board that goes on a heart and basically causes the heart to pump in the correct way. So it just sleeves around a heart and just says, now we will send you the correct, correct impulses and you will, it will beat and it will work. It's lightweight, it's very effective and easy to produce. This is epic. This is the way of the future. And if we, if we think of like where we are right now, we're thinking of things like big data. We're thinking of things like virtual reality, AR, VR, ML. All these things are crazy, they're coming together, and if we start blending all this stuff together, we can make magic because we are creators. So when we do something like, let's get our creator hat on. Imagine you have a insulin pump on you, okay? And you hook it up to a device that says, it shows you your insulin. And it basically works out your kind of your blood sugar and it says, you now need to get 150 mils of apple juice into you. And it connects to your phone and says, here are the directions to the nearest shop to buy this. And when you get there, it says, actually, you need 173 milliliters to bring your, uh, your insulin back up. Like, that is the genius of what you can do with this data transformation connecting to the cloud, doing all this kind of cool stuff. And that's where we are. We're at that kind of creator stage. Everyone in the audience is probably a creator going, I can do mad stuff. And then we have to think about, what if someone abuses it? And we look at something like Facebook 
and Twitter? Did Mark Zuckerberg, did Jack, think that when they invented Facebook in 20, 2005 and Twitter in 2007, that they would become tools to rig a US political election? Did they think they would be standing in front of Congress explaining why their platform was used by Russian troll farms to influence votes? Facebook was set up so I could share pictures of cats and friends. It was not meant to rig an election. But the human has a fantastic way of corrupting technology for their own use. We do this all the time. So when I was building this talk, I was thinking, okay, what is probably the maddest thing that we're going to start seeing in this kind of space of biomechanical, bio software engineering? And I spotted this, a Samsung smart contact lens. I thought, this is crazy. I started thinking, I, my first off, my brain went into, let's make cool shit with this. Could you imagine having these things on and basically you're knocking around and you can get your directions of where you have to go instead of having to look at your phone and do the usual, oops, telephone pole, oops, tree, oops, something else, you know, it would just show you where you need to go. Your phone rings, a small thing pops up, you get FaceTime right here and you can see and have a private conversation because you've got implants and embeds. You've got things like, for example, hi, I would like to have an eidetic memory. Eidetic meaning I will never forget. I would like to know 57 languages. Sure, we can do that, we can give you an upgrade. Wouldn't that be cool? That's where we're starting to see. Like this is, you know, sensors can be, with it, lenses are equipped with a built-in camera and sensors can be controlled by simply blinking. You might be having an epileptic fit or taking very good shots, I don't know. But this is where we're going. It is getting to the point where we can say, oh, this is awesome. And then I start getting into my security mode and how could I break this? And I thought, oh, where is something that allows near field communication? Because it says, you know, content is sent to your smartphone through embedded antennas. This is where the data is processed. I said, so we would be going at the phone and then sending data to your eye. Oh, this is going to be good. So do you know like the little NFC um, where you had what we had Bluetooth LE or not, uh, you know, the Bluetooth near field where, for example, you'd walk into a, a room and it would tell you, tell your device, you've got a deal here, like in a coffee shop, for example, or it would give you the latest directions or give you, send, send you advertising content or something to that effect. And what people have started doing now is they're getting these little devices and they're coming into coffee shops and just sticking them onto the counter. And for people's devices that are turned on, they send an invalid QR code to it and says, congratulations, here's a voucher you can use, please click the link. You click the link for free coffee, it turns out to be malware that infects your phone. Because the fish in the lure is very effective. It's in the right place, everything looks good. And this is where it gets abused. How many of you use Apple devices? All right. And you know the kind of, what is the, I've just named the thing that's escaped my head now. Is it uh, where they do the, as a file drop, what's the sharing? Air, uh, airdrop. And that has been abused by a lot of people. People on trains are randomly sending dick pics to people on other parts of the train. Basically, here's some sexual abuse, go nuts. But that is because the human is fantastic at corrupting what someone said, this is very innocent tech. And we look at things like, for example, this. This is, uh, Scott, don't you have a NFC chip in your, yeah, he's cyborged out. Um, and this, this is actually the same company, I think, that did it in Sweden. And they, what they do is they, can, they have this thing where they say, these tiny chips are implanted in the flesh between the thumb and the forefinger. And what they can do is they enable people to open their front door, access their office, start their car with a wave of a hand, and also store medical data. This is brilliant. And I went, this is crazy. Imagine the idea of giving someone a handshake and unlocking their house. It is like, that's my brain thinking. It's like, this could be done as a cool relay, at relay attack. You basically scan everyone and you figure out information about them. You go use that information and then go open their house. And they're wondering, how did the thief get in? I don't have any keys. They have to have my hand and my hand is here. How did they do it? A simple handshake, wander in, steal something. And I thought, okay, that sounds crazy. No one would do that, right? Yes, no one would, I definitely wouldn't shake hands with you. Um, no one would do that. But where are we using like keyless entry already? 
cars. Now, you wouldn't download a car, <laughs> but you could steal it. So here we have one. Now this is using two, I think, is it a hack RF scanners? And what they're gonna do here is the lads are gonna drive up, the person has their front door locked, as usual, and the two lads are very nonchalantly getting out of the car, as you can see. They're gonna wander over, and there's, you can see one lad with a torch and something else, and they're gonna look at the car and see what's going on. And they're like, ah, okay, this looks good, this looks good. And this, the other fellow then starts like randomly going around checking for a signal, okay? Pretty cool, excellent, and wait for it. Carl flash, woo -hoo. Okay, into the car. Now this, this is where it gets a bit funny because the other lad's going off, and he goes, hang on a second, crap, I need to start the car, don't I? Um, um, and you can see him, he's like, he doesn't know what's really going on, this is the first time doing it. He's like, okay, fine. So he goes back over, same thing again, and this is where it gets a bit hairy because at the point when the car starts, because if it's not a Tesla, it's got noise. So when the car starts, he takes a legger, okay? They've now just robbed a car without the keys. Because they're just doing a replay attack. What they're doing is they're relaying data to the, because it was a proximity-based attack. And this is, this is where the kind of the idea of, no one would break this, no one would do something like this. This is absolutely crazy. Why would someone do this? Because they can, and they will, because they're going to make money from it. And we look at new pacemaker, hack puts malware directly on the device. The first pacemaker haps, uh, emerged a, de a decade ago. So can you imagine someone putting malware on your device? Like here, we're going to crypto mine your heart. You're going to be very warm for a while. Go outside, land in the snow. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're, you know, if you've got an Apple Watch, your rings are closed. Three seconds, oh Christ. <laughs> Someone crypto jacked my heart, therefore uh, my rings are closed. Like, I think this is insane because what is happening here is people are doing things that normally any sane person would go, this is crazy. But this, someone said, I can do this, so I'm therefore going to try it. And I'm going to make money from it. Now, you can, like, if you can imagine an adult getting a pacemaker or something like this, but imagine a child with a pacemaker and someone hacks that, and you're left with your child sitting there going, I'll give your child a heart attack unless you pay me a lot of money. That threat, that risk. And this is where I kind of... I'm taking you very deep into the dark parts of how this could work, because we are creating tech that sometimes may not be very easily updatable because it's embedded in someone, in someone. So we have to think a little bit more about the risk, all the potentials that could potentially happen, and stress test this to hell. So we have to look at the past, look at the things that were done before, look at how people went and attacked other things beforehand that have now been fixed. IoT is an emerging tech still. Things are happening because people want to get this stuff to market as quick as possible. Do you want to be the new Fitbit? In other words, the reference point for how we do digital tracking. Or do you want to be the kind of the also ran? So if you get it out there, security is always the last thing you think about it. The S in IoT stands for security. Oh, you're all awake for that one, good. So I'm gonna take you back into yourself a small bit. And we started the talk with a small little breathing exercise. So I want all again now to close your eyes, because it's been a quite a hectic and we're dark. So I want you to all close your eyes again. Take a deep breath back in through your nose, out through your mouth. In again, out again. Keep your eyes closed. Ladies and gentlemen, how many of you can trust your code to keep you alive, to keep your family alive? And if you believe so, please raise your hand. Keep your eyes closed. Everyone, open your eyes and look around. That is what we need to change. Not one person believes that their code would keep their family alive. And we are writing tech and building tech that will go into people and try and attempt to keep them alive. But that is the thing. 
we need to change this. And that is where you, as the creator, as the person that's going to be doing this, will be able to make a difference. Take the challenge of looking for a risk. Take the challenge to be a bit paranoid. Take the challenge to look for threats. Read about it. Experiment. Try and break your system as if you are my two-year-old trying to get a cookie. Look at your risk picture and, object and objectively look at it and say, am I doing it correctly? Is there something I'm missing? Have someone come in and fact check you a little bit. And remember, we will create the next generation of awesome. We will be able to give you that upgrade. You will have an eidetic memory. You will speak 57 languages. You will, we will be able to keep people alive for longer and for cheaper. Ladies and gentlemen, that's been How to Hack a Cat. Thank you very much. I'll open the floor to questions. And if it's one, if I've got a pacemaker, nope. Anything there? It's a real theoretical talk. So if you want to go and go grab coffee, you are free to do so. Thank you all. Please remember to vote. I like greens and yellows, but not reds. If you don't, you have a red, just give it a try. <laughs> I was just about to say that was a nice talk, but I'll take it back. <laughs> Yeah, but I just yeah. love that relay attack concept. It was just, I was just thinking, if you, had, if you did that inside the cinema, well, you, uh, you know, it, I know it's very near field. So check something.